Angelo Agostinelli ran the local shop and caravan park where he lived with his wife for the last 12 months. But one morning, Gina woke to find her husband had disappeared. There was a ring of truth to some of what he had to say. We thought it was just two people. Then it was a third person, now it was a fourth person. I suggested to her that what she had told me now cast some serious doubts upon her story. It all got too much for him, I think. And he explained that he could cope with it by practising yoga. We found quite a significant amount of blood. But the rumours continued, and fairly strong rumours. This was another twist in this whole saga. It came as a complete surprise. The disappearance of Angelo Agostinelli would send the small town of Millicent into a frenzy of rumours. There were some dirty little secrets hidden in the caravan park where Angelo lived with his wife, and forensics would uncover every last trace of them. I was working at the Millicent Police Station and received a phone call from Gina Agostinelli from the local lakeside caravan park in Delhi, which was actually my local deli around the corner from home saying that her husband had gone missing. She told me that Angelo had been missing for a week, um, that they'd had an argument, a domestic argument, and she'd told him to piss off. And I was a bit wary about why he'd been gone for a week, but she told me it wasn't unusual because he'd uh, left earlier in the year in February and he'd gone down to Adelaide to be with friends and family after another domestic dispute, and she hadn't heard from him for the first two or three days of that trip, so just presumed this was the same. I thought they had a very good marriage. They were always together. Gina would be sitting on his lap. And uh, I thought there was, you know, very, you know, they were very affectionate towards each other. The couple had been married for five years. Gina had two children from a previous marriage. So I thought Angelo and Gina might have had a little, you know, husband and wife tiff or something that he'd sort of just gone away for a couple of days to call off. The family had indicated that he had left before and had gone down to Adelaide and seen them. So they weren't overly surprised. But this time, Angelo hadn't taken anything with him. He'd just pick up his phone, phoned an unknown person, and Gina didn't know who it was, and had just said the words, meet me, and then had walked straight out of the van. And she told me that Angelo hadn't taken his car, hadn't taken his phone, She'd subsequently found $5,000 missing from the safe, but she didn't think he'd taken it that night because the safe was within the van and she felt she would have heard him go to the safe to take the money and leave. So this $5,000 missing cash meant one of two things. He'd pre-planned leaving or he'd come back at some stage and sneaked in and taken the cash. In the small town of Millicent, word spread quickly that Angelo had disappeared. Most of the townsfolk thought one and one only thing. Angelo was having an affair. Gina had heard some rumours around town from people that um, Angelo, in fact, might have been having a relationship with a lady from Tantanula. Given that I knew of the woman through some health issues that she had and also the fact that she had uh, associated with a number of men in the past, I wasn't quite surprised at the fact that Angelo might have gone out there. So one of the things uh, naturally was to go out to Tantanula and check to see if he'd uh, been seen out there at that house. Knocked on the door, checked around the house and there was no one there. So I spoke to neighbours and people there indicated to me that the woman was last seen a week prior to me arriving and she'd gone to Adelaide. And that was very interesting because it timed exactly with the time that uh, Angelo had uh, left the caravan park. I was very confident that it was just a missing persons report and that the husband and wife had had a dispute. I expected him to come back or at least be found very quickly so it wouldn't be a long outstanding missing persons file. Three days after the report had been filed, there was no sign of Angelo or the woman from Tantanula. 
And while Angelo may have taken the $5,000 from the safe, none of his bank accounts or four life insurance policies had been touched. I thought that he could have gone with the other woman, but my brother wouldn't have gone anywhere without his four-wheel drive. He just loved his car and just liked driving it, and he wanted to be with it, and he wouldn't let anybody drive it. And uh, he just loved his four-wheel drive. So I asked the family those normal questions about whether he might have been involved in gambling or whether it was drugs or anything else in the background, or about whether they believed he might be suicidal. Police asked me if Angelo was suicidal or depressed, and I said no, he, he's not, he wouldn't have been, no. My brother was never into gambling, he wasn't into drugs. And Jean indicated that he'd been under a bit of stress at work, and of course their domestic argument, but never that uh, there was an indication that he would commit suicide. The family decided to put a letter in the paper, but again the 33-year-old made no contact. This time I started to think that there were only three possible scenarios because it had been a fair while that he'd been missing. One is that he has left with uh, the other woman or someone else who'd been the meet me. Two, he's committed suicide, which was highly unlikely. And the third one was foul play. Doesn't matter if you don't get in touch with me, just ring somebody to let us know where you are, please. Angelo Agostinelli had been missing for nearly two weeks. The last time he had been seen by his wife, they were fighting. The rumour was that he'd run off with another woman. She had just been found. We caught up with this woman, spoke with her, and she told us that she knew Angelo but was not involved in any relationship with him. She said that she had been to the Caravan Park, Delhi, on a couple of occasions and had spoken to Angelo while she had been there. But other than that, she had no further dealings with him. Now, another rumour was doing the rounds of the town. Millicent's an interesting town where nearly everybody knows everybody, and I think that's been uh, one of the problems with this case. Uh, rumour then started to get around, and I was told that, in fact, Gary Lewis and Gina had been having an affair. Gary Lewis was the local butcher and had been living in the caravan park for six months. Gina denied that she'd been having any sort of relationship with a person named Gary. Hey, Gary. Hey, Gary. She said that uh, her relationship with Angelo was a good relationship, that he was a loving husband, but they had normal marital arguments and argued about things uh, that went on from day to day in the caravan park. It was important then that we speak as soon as possible with Gary, and he denied that he was involved in any way, shape or form in any relationship. He got on very well with both uh, Angelo and Gina and had, had in fact played cards with them on a regular basis, so he rated himself as a good friend. And he would take evening walks with Gina, but uh, there was no more to their relationship than that. I felt that there was a liaison between Gina and Gary. However, I believe there was still a strong chance that Angelo would be found because he had left home once before and did return. And there was still the persistent rumour that Angelo was with the woman from Tantanula. We were confident the lady said that she hadn't had a relationship with him, but the rumours continued, and some fairly strong rumours. So we still had patrols keeping an eye on the house, looking for him, in fact, looking through windows, just trying to make sure he wasn't there. Then there was another rumour. This time, Steve Chappell's wife heard at the local beauty salon that Gina had cut her arm on the meat slicer at the deli. This happened around the same time that Angelo disappeared. And so, next move was to find out why Gina hadn't told us and what had happened. Gina explained to me that she hadn't cut her arm on the meat slicer, as she had told people, but that she had had a fight with Angelo on the night of his disappearance that during the argument that she had raised her arm and pointed a finger at him and that he had picked up a knife from the kitchen bench and moved his arm towards her and cut her arm in that motion. She had wrapped her arm in a green towel and then went down to Gary's caravan where she sought Gary's assistance to go to the hospital to seek some treatment for the cut on her arm. Gina said that she hadn't told us earlier about the cut because she didn't want Angelo to get into any trouble or she didn't want to make trouble for his family. 
I suggested to her that what she had told me now cast some serious doubts upon her story and that she was somehow involved in Angelo's disappearance and that Gary may be involved as well. And she denied that strongly and what she had told me was the truth. Police hoped the truth would be found via forensics. Gina was nervous, but she was willing to show us the arm and she was willing to show us around the caravan. There were some traces of blood in the caravan area on some carpet. It gave them the impression that the stain was quite old and it didn't look very fresh. And given the time this occurred, it wasn't likely that that was caused by bleeding from her arm, although I still obviously did the hematuria test and found that it did contain traces of blood. The carpet was cut out and taken for further testing, but no other blood could be found anywhere in the caravan. And which was a little unusual. When you consider the size of that laceration, you'd expect blood to get somewhere, even sort of under the crack of a bit of lino or somewhere where you wouldn't necessarily get to it to clean it up. Then we moved on to the vehicle that uh, Angelo owned and really loved so dearly. That was his pride and joy. It was a um, like a four-wheel drive with a, a tailgate flip-up. And in that tailgate area, I did find what appeared to be a blood stain, and I did the presumptive test again for blood and found some faint possible blood stain on, on that back tailgate area. But it wasn't really enough to seize the vehicle at the time. So then we just locked the vehicle up and gave back the keys. The next time I spoke to Gina, she'd phoned me up and um, was quite upset and, in fact, told me to tell the detectives to leave her alone and that they were picking on her and that uh, they believed she was involved in Angelo's disappearance in some way. And she kept telling me to tell them to look in the right place. I asked, well, what's the right place? And she just kept saying, the right place. Couldn't uh, take me any further. Police had continued to keep an eye on the house and the woman from Tanjanula but they were also looking elsewhere. 33-year-old Angelo Agostinelli has been missing for over two weeks. He was last seen at the Lakeside Caravan Park in Millicent, where he lived and was the proprietor. While there have been a number of sightings and rumours to his whereabouts, he has made no contact with his family. Today, police searched the local swimming lake and the nearby scrubland, but found nothing. They are still treating his disappearance as a missing persons case. Yes, at this time, yes, but uh, uh, we're quite concerned for his uh, present whereabouts and safety. But thoughts of missing turned directly to murder when the crime scene team returned for a further look at Angelo's car. I had quite a sinking feeling that, uh-oh, uh I should have probably seized this vehicle. That's immediately what I thought. I thought, boy, I've made a blue here. Separating fact from fiction was one of the main considerations for the detectives investigating the disappearance of Angelo Agostinelli. Had Angelo left his wife for another woman? Was his wife having an affair with another man? And why had Gina not told police that her husband had cut her during the fight on the night he left? Now another question was added to the list. Who had removed the faint blood stain that Phil Argy had seen when he first examined the car? Embarrassingly, it looked like it had faded, and I thought, gee, a couple of days later, that's amazing that it's faded. So I had this quite a sinking feeling that, uh, uh oh, I should have probably seized this vehicle. That's immediately what I thought. I thought Boy, I've made a blue here. But in hindsight, it was probably not a bad thing because what it actually did was it caused someone to actually clean the stain because they were quite worried that we'd found this stain. And when we had a, yeah, another look at the vehicle, we actually did find some blood that was in behind the lever of the tailgate door handle, which again, you know, weighted the evidence towards this vehicle had been used in some respect to the transport, possibly of a person that was bleeding. At this point, I kept an open mind about whose blood or what uh, the source of that blood in the car and spoke to Gina about that and asked her where she had travelled in the car when she injured her arm. And she said that she had travelled in the front and she couldn't explain why there should be blood in the rear section or on the tailgate of the car. A day later, the possible answer to how that blood got there was put forward by one of the Caravan Park residents. Henry Miller 
came forward with a story that um, Angelo had been working on the back of the four-wheel drive repairing a window from one of the vans and that he'd uh, cut himself with the drill bit. I went back and I examined the caravan. I took some photographs of the caravan that was allegedly fixed up by Angelo. I checked the caravan window where he would have used the drill to put a new pot rivet in. There was no evidence of blood on that caravan. I checked that thoroughly. I, I was trying, obviously, to either support or deny that story of Henry Miller's. When Angelo's car had been taken for forensic examination, it had been pulled apart. We stripped back the trim of the tailgate and inside the trim, on the actual locking mechanism inside the tailgate, which you couldn't normally see, there was about 10 cc's or 10 millilitres of blood, which is, we just estimated that, was quite a significant amount of blood. Not anywhere near the amount of blood described by the residents. Because we asked Henry, you know, how much did it bleed? And he said that Angelo fixed it with a Band-Aid, I think, from memory. So, like, it wasn't consistent with the amount of blood found inside the tailgate. What had happened, we presumed, was that blood had dripped down from inside the window glass of the tailgate down inside the lock. And whoever had cleaned up the blood on the window itself didn't obviously pull the tailgate apart, so we actually found the blood on the inside of the locking mechanism, which was quite a breakthrough. The interesting part about that was that Henry was prompted to remember that story and to come forward with it by Gina, which again made us think this is more of finding stories to protect the real truth. Blood from the car was sent to Adelaide for DNA testing, along with samples from Angelo's family. The police wanted the blood test, uh, so they, they wanted to make sure that if it was Angelo's blood or some, you know, someone else's blood in the back of the Angelo's vehicle. At the same time, major crime detectives headed down from Adelaide to assist the investigation. At this point, we had serious concerns and suspicions about the foul play in relation to Angelo's disappearance. But unfortunately, we still couldn't rule out 100% that he hadn't taken off with another woman. The rumours around town were still rife to that effect. So we couldn't, as I say, rule out 100% that he wasn't alive and well somewhere in and hiding. One of the ways to try and help resolve those issues of whether he was still a missing person or that there'd been foul play was to try and put something out onto the electronic media. Gina, first of all, um, what would you like to say to Angelo? Well, Ange, wherever you are, whatever, whatever's happened, just please come out. Doesn't matter if you don't get in touch with me, just ring somebody to let us know where you are, please. We're in enough hurt as it is at the moment. So please, please get in touch with somebody, please. Ida, what would you like to say to Angelo? I'd like to say to Angelo that we're really missing him and this is so unlike him. Why doesn't he ring one of us? Doesn't matter what he's done, it just doesn't matter. We all make mistakes in life and life must go on. We can help him and we are here to help him to the fullest. My family and I returned to Millicent and uh, my sister and I, we did a plea on TV down at Millicent Caravan Park, thinking that Angelo would see this film and ring up the family or ring somebody or even if someone had seen Angelo around to ring, you know, the police. Gina, can you think of any reason why uh, Angelo might have left? No, nothing at all. I would have to say during that, um, Gina was very convincing. She was quite emotional, very strong in her need for him to come home. And given our suspicions, um, it sort of confirmed my belief that if our suspicions were right, she was a very manipulative uh, person and a very good actor. Not long after the appeal was made, the blood results came back. The blood found in the car was indeed Angelo Agostinelli's. We believed we were investigating a homicide. We believed that Angelo had been murdered, and more than likely, Gary and Gina were responsible for it. Police believed the best way forward was to put listening devices in Gina's caravan and Gary's cabin. They hoped the couple would talk about Angelo's disappearance or his murder. What they heard was totally unexpected. 
doesn't matter if you don't get in touch with me. Just ring somebody to let us know where you are, please. Police believed that Gina Agostinelli was responsible for the disappearance and possible murder of her husband, Angelo, and that Gary Lewis, her alleged lover, was involved. But listening devices in Gary's cabin turned up another suspect. We had no idea that there might be other people involved in the disappearance, apart from Gina and Gary. And when this resident said what she did say, it became obvious to us that uh, there was a third player, at least, involved in this uh, investigation, and that she had some knowledge about it. The resident was Helen Miller. She was a good friend of Gina's and had verified with police that she had washed the towel that Gina had given her from the night her arm had been cut. Helen was also the wife of Henry Miller, who had told police about Angelo's so-called accident with the drill. The listening devices were monitored on a daily basis, and we knew Helen went to Gary's cabin, and they spoke, and Helen said something along the lines of, I don't know how I can cope any longer. And Gary explained to her that he could cope with it by practising yoga. The conversation between this resident and Gary that didn't give specifics, that didn't mention Angelo had been done away with, or words of that effect, but uh, just the tone of the conversation. It was obvious to us that that's, that's what they were talking about. And it became imperative to uh, speak to her at some stage. It was decided that because they were actually talking, it would be a good idea just to, to let it, the listening device run a bit longer, just to encourage a bit more conversation. Uh, we may have uh, learnt a bit more about it. We may have learnt where Angelo was, was buried, if that was the case. It was now time to start putting together the theory that Angela had been put in the vehicle and dumped, uh, taken somewhere. So we looked at Canunda National Park. An extensive search of bushland around the Millicent area in the state's southeast failed to find any trace of Angelo Agostinelli when he's believed to have left the lakeside caravan park after an argument. Have you any suspicions at all that you can tell us about? I can confirm that uh, on the night of his disappearance, following the domestic argument, the missing person's wife was treated at the Millicent Hospital for a knife wound to her wrist. Also that there's been uh, some blood located in his motor car. By doing that search, we hoped it might prompt Gina and Gary to speak about what the police were doing and were they looking in the right place or the wrong place and give us some indication or clue as to where to look. Gina and Gary said nothing. The only indication that Angelo had likely been murdered was the cryptic message of not being able to cope from resident Helen Miller. The detectives decided it was time to bring her in. Mr. Moore, if you touch this light, you, you just choose where you'd like to start and you just tell, tell us what you know, please. Gary, same got me on the Thursday morning, around about 1.30, I'd say and uh, asked me to watch the kids because she had a cut arm. Gary took her to the hospital. I don't know what else she wanted me to say. How did she say she'd done it? She told me Angelo cut it. Did she say why did it occur? That they had an argument. Why is it that when we spoke to you back on the 6th of June, you told us that you first were around to cut at 5.30, 6 o'clock when you went to the toilet? She asked me to say that. Do you know why? I've got no idea. Did you kill anyone? To my knowledge. Are you sure? Yes, I am sure. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. Do they have to know that I said anything? What we want to know is what to I know, but I don't, I don't want them to know that I said anything. We're looking at something quite serious. I think you know more than you're saying. I don't know what to say. All we want to know is what you know. Well, Angelo's dead. How do you know that? Harry's shocking. Whereabouts? In the 
in January, is that right? Yes. Were you present? No, why? Did you hear any shots? No. How did you know that they shot him? Because of what they told me. Who's they? Jenny and Gary. Have you got any idea where the boys are? I honestly wouldn't have a clue. Honest, if I knew, I would tell you. I know I did the wrong thing by covering up for this, but I didn't. I've never seen. I don't know why I let myself get him to work. I should have stayed away. As a result of hearing this information, we arrested both Gina and Gary and charged them with the offences of murder. All oh, the family was, we were very shocked about hearing about Gina getting arrested and I, I didn't think that she was capable of murder. No. I didn't think she was capable of doing it. We thought if Gina wasn't happy being with my brother, she could have left him or, you know, it would take a you know, person's life, I don't know. Both Agostinelli and Lewis appeared in court this afternoon before Mr Justice Brown. In opposing bail, Assistant Police Prosecutor Graham Smith claimed police were concerned that Lewis may interfere with the Crown's vital witness, a woman. In further opposing bail, the prosecutor said police are concerned that the accused may interfere with the body of Mr Agostinelli, which has not been found. Today, the search effort stepped up. Acting on information, major crime squad officers and a host of local police scoured the Millicent Rubbish Dump. The Millicent Rubbish Dump joins the National Park and butchers have a key to that dump so they can get in at any time to use an offal pit. Gary is a butcher and has access to that area and knows that area and we considered it possible that Angelo may have been dumped at the dump or at the offal pit but uh, that search proved fruitless. It was decided to go back to Helen Miller um, and see what else she knew, whether she was holding things back. And we learned that Gary hadn't actually shot Angela, that Gary had told Helen that he'd actually had stabbed Angela. And it was during the course of the stabbing that Gina had received the wound to her wrist. With that information, police contacted Gina's solicitors in the hope that she might tell them what really went on the night Angelo disappeared. She initially agreed to show them where her husband's body was, and then changed her mind. That wasn't the case when detectives contacted Gary Lewis. He gave them an exact location. We went into the scrub, made our way into the scrub about five metres, and uh, there we, we did, we found a body. He was covered over with some twigs and branches, but still visible through those twigs and branches. When the branches and undergrowth were moved away from the top of the body, we could see that uh, he was wearing a particular shirt which had the word Lakeside Delhi written on it. And uh, at this stage, we were very confident that the body we had found was that of Angelo Agostinelli. As Angelo's body was taken to the morgue, Police began an interview with Gary Lewis. I understand that you wish to, uh, to make a statement to me this morning in connection with the disappearance of Angelo Agostinello. Is that correct, Gary? That's true. As a result, further secrets in the caravan park were about to be uncovered. And another murder. The man's body was discovered 10 metres off a track in the Canunda National Park near Millicent at 11 o'clock this morning. Although formal identification is yet to be made, police say there's little doubt it's that of the 33-year-old caravan park owner. As the police awaited the results of the post-mortem, Gary Lewis was freely talking, telling police that he had got roped in to the murder. I went up to the shop one night and there was a hell of a row going on. He was getting stuck into G knot. He had bad mood swings, always complaining about different things. It was always at the children. And that's when Gina and I used to get very close. All I know is I just wanted to help Gina. He says that during this time he got closer to Gina 
and uh, she continually said that she wanted Angelo dead and came to this uh, night that Gina summonsed him to the caravan. What uh, was the nature of the discussion with Gina, can you recall? She wanted him down in the night. Did you go into the caravan? Yes. So, tell me what you saw in there. Angelo was lying on the bed. She was outside. I was standing in the bedroom. Didn't know what to do. And she'd come back in the van. I'd make some excuse. And she'd go back outside again. I was trapped. He woke up. And she had just come in at that time. He tried to walk across the bed. On our up head. Gary then told us that they took Angelo outside and put him in the, uh, the back of his van and were going to drive him to the hospital to receive treatment. He says on the way to the hospital, Gina was still insisting that Gary finish the job. And what was Gina saying? She was just screaming at me. To do what? To do it. She right. wanted me to kill him for her and the boys. Right. And she just kept at me. And when we stopped, we got him out of the car. Do you remember where that was? No, just on the side of the road. He yeah. wanted to get out and be sick. Right. And tell me what happened there at that point. Well, that's when Gina started yelling at me again. Right. To do it. And she kept at me. I don't know what happened, I just. Reached out with a knife. There's nothing to smack. I'll never forget his voice. He just yelled at me, why did you do that for? How many times did you stab him? Only the once. And he thinks it was during this motion of stabbing that he also stabbed Gina in the arm. Gary then told the police he had put Angelo into the back of the car and driven him to an area where he then dragged his body into the bush. What's your reason for, uh, for doing this? Are you involved in a, a relationship with Gina? No. How far does your relationship extend? A very, very close friend. Is there nothing further than that between yourself and Gina? Once or twice since this has all happened. And what's happened since? We've been the men together. At this point of the confession, the results of the post mortem came in. Angelo had been stabbed, not once as Gary had claimed, but multiple times. The internal examination of the body showed quite obvious cuts to three of the ribs on the left-hand side. And in addition, we have a penetrating stab wound to the left ventricle of the heart. What's important there is that the damage to the ribs and the damage to the heart are all on the left side of the chest. And they correspond to the position of the stab holes in the T-shirt. The jumper, on the other hand, only had a single stab wound. And that suggested that the jumper had been partially pulled off before the stab holes to the left chest were inflicted. It's quite possible that uh, one or more of the stab holes were inflicted after he died, perhaps after the body had been moved to the situation in which it was found. The other major finding at the post-mortem examination was a substantial head wound. So serious was the injury, that it could not have been caused by Angelo hitting his head against the cupboard. A weapon was involved. And the obvious suggestion is a hammer, but something bigger of the nature of a sledgehammer could uh, achieve this result. So as to how the uh, events of the night unfolded, in what order, uh, and uh, when these injuries were, were, were inflicted, uh, we can only presume or speculate I thought that Gary was very much trying to minimise his role in what had taken place. There was a ring of truth to some of what he had to say, 
but a lot of it was trying to diminish his responsibility. In fact, Gary had told the police that Gina had been trying to kill Angelo for months and that Helen Miller, the whistleblower, had been part of the plan. That Helen Miller used to crush up tablets. That she used to do some cooking for them. Yes. And she used to put the tablets in cakes and stuff to make her Angelo. Who told you that? She did herself. You're saying you think there was some conspiracy between Helen and Gina to poison Angelo? We went and saw Helen and put to her the allegations that she was involved. She admitted she had made cream puffs and she had crushed 18 tablets and put into six cream puffs to be given to Angelo to try and kill him. But the poisoning attempts didn't stop there. Gary also implicated Helen's son Adrian into the conspiracy. And then a son. I think he even went to Melbourne once to try and get drugs. The police spoke with Adrian and he admitted that had happened. Gina gave him $600 to do this, but once he got there, he decided he didn't really want to be a part of this. All got too much for him, I think. He decided to buy some speed. They did, in fact, give some uh, of this to Angelo, but it didn't have much effect on him. I think he just developed a bit of a headache out of it all. Adrian had also said that Gina had told him, quite bluntly, that she didn't want half, she wanted the lot, meaning the houses that they owned in Adelaide, and there was a, a rather healthy life insurance policy on uh, Angelo's life. Helen also told us that Gina had drugged Angelo's mule on the night that he was killed. A standard toxicology screening had been done on Angelo's remains. And the results indicated low levels of a drug called diazepam. Diazepam is sold under a variety of names, the commonest or best known of which is Cervalium. Adrian and Helen Miller were charged with conspiracy to murder, but not before they had spilt the entire can of beans. This was yet another twist in this whole saga came as a complete surprise. Um, we now found that we were possibly investigating a second homicide. When Angelo Agostinelli disappeared, police had no idea that they would have four people implicated in his murder. We thought it had been confined to initially just two people, then it was a third person, now it was a fourth person. That fourth person, Adrian Miller, was now telling police that Gary Lewis had killed another man. This was yet another twist in this whole saga and came as a complete surprise. The story was that um, an itinerant was in town and he was nicknamed Bluey and that Gary and Gina had arranged for him to kill Angelo for a fee of a thousand dollars. And uh, Bluey allegedly asked for more money um, he argued with Gary over this, and Gary had killed Bluey. Bluey was meant to have been murdered in the house where Gary formerly lived prior to going to the caravan park. Adrian had told the detectives that he'd actually visited the house and that he'd seen a large stained area on the, the carpet. So when police went back to the scene, they were able to confirm that there was a stain on the floor but it had been cleaned with chemicals, so blood traces were sort of very hard to find. But they found a split waterbed bladder. Adrian said that uh, Gary had killed Bluey and put him into a split waterbed bladder and that he'd taken him out and buried him very close to, in fact, where Angelo was found under Bevlock's Ford. The waterbed bladder was inspected. Tests were done on it and it gave a weak indication for blood. And the blood was non-indicative of any of the people that were involved in the case, so whose blood is it? It's an unknown. There was also a piece of paper located at the house, simply with the words, Gina, $1,000, which reinforced our belief that uh, Bluey did exist. As a result of this information, I went and saw Gary again in the jail and spoke to him about Bluey. No such person as Bluey. Bluey was a, a make-up person. 
We went Helen and Adrian. Ron and Dad getting rid of Angelo. The pressure started to mount on me. The only thing I could come up with was to make up for Louis. Did you tell them anything else, what you'd done with his body? Yeah, I told them I'd dumped his body under the bridge. Did you put anybody's body under that bridge? No. Okay. Louis don't exist, Alan. Louis exists up here, mate. In your mind? He does exist up there. But police believed Bluey may well have existed. Locals had seen an itinerant around the town and given them a description. They were now searching under the bridge where his body was allegedly buried. We went out to that bridge and we had a range of people out there with us, people to be able to pump out the water with emergency services trucks, people down in there digging underneath. We even got to divers down from the police squad in Adelaide and they had to dive in um, three foot of black murky water and feel their way along the drain. So we did a fairly extensive search, but unfortunately there was nothing found. You're still convinced there is a body? We're certainly convinced there's a body. And how connected is it with the Gostinelli case? Well, as I say, it is not connected with Angelo's death, but it is related to it. Are you phased by the fact you didn't find a body yesterday? We're very disappointed, yes. Because on the information we have, other information proved to be correct, and the location of the body Apparently not so. What reason do you think there could be for it not being here? Well, when the body was put here, we understand that the bed of the canal was dry. But since then, of course, several feet of water have been through and the body may have been dislodged. Despite searching downstream, the body was never found. But one interesting item did turn up. What was found was a large sledgehammer, which was found under the bridge, which I suspected may have been the weapon used to cause the fatal or the near fatal injury to Angelo on the night he was murdered, but that was never proven. Nine months after Angelo Agostinelli had been reported missing, his wife and Gary Lewis stood trial for his murder. But the proceedings took an abrupt halt. During the second week of the trial, they changed their plea of not guilty to guilty. And I think this was mainly due to the overwhelming evidence that had been mounted up against them and also largely I think to the evidence that was given by Helen and Adrian Miller. Gina and Gary were both given life sentences with a non-parole period of 20 years but in an appeal against the severity of the sentence that non-parole period was reduced. Both will be eligible for parole in 2011. Because Helen and Adrian Miller agreed to give evidence their charges were reduced. Helen was charged with uh, impeding an investigation and administering a poison. She was sentenced to four years jail and did one year before being released on parole. And uh, Adrian received a, a suspended sentence. Just prior to the trial commencing, the woman from Tantanula was found hanging in her house. Her death was ruled as a suicide. Bluey's body has yet to be found.